just going to go ahead and jump in. We, we're doing a strike all of H25. Um, this is a, a completely new language. It's just one section amending our attempt statute. Um, so before I walk through it, I'll just start out by saying currently under Vermont law, there are two elements required for an attempt. The first is an intent um, to commit a certain crime, and the second is an overt act designed to carry out that intent. So the Supreme Court has held that the necessary act has to reach beyond the mere intent and far enough toward achieving the desired result as to an amount to the commencement of a crime. So um, bearing that in mind, we're going to all walk through this amended attempt language. So subsection A provides that except as provided in subsection D, that's the standard for attempt, the intent plus the overt act. And subsection D is where we list all of these violent felonies that were formerly listed in subsection A. So all that structure language that providing that um, providing for those violent felonies and public are punished as the offense attempted to committed, be committed is are punishable. That we're just moving that language down to another section of the bill. So that remains unchanged. I forgot to mention that the governor uh, meeting on Friday and then in a press release on Friday asked that the legislature pass in two bills by Friday, this Friday. One dealing with attempts and one dealing with um, domestic terrorism, um, which surprised many of us. <clears throat> it may be a little unrealistic, but we can certainly make the attempt at attempts. But domestic terrorism, um, mm -hmm. and I'm pleased to see uh, John Campbell here since he was the sponsor of the domestic terrorism bill of 2002 along with then Senator Peter Shumlin. Uh, so, uh, I don't know. It, it might be that might need to be revised the domestic terrorism bill to include firearms, but right now it's mainly a weapons of mass destruction. But they, uh, I can remember the debate that was something about bodies in reservoirs, and Senator Camp at the time, Senator Campbell was explaining how bodies ended up in wet reservoirs in these times of mass. Matt there. Valerio remembers that debate. Yeah, uh, that was that's not hated. That was not exactly what was being said. Well, maybe at some point you can revive your speech on bodies and reservoirs as a result of mass weapons of mass. So. Anyway, those that's we're dealing with attempts. And we should deal with attempts anyways, based upon the recent Supreme Court ruling. So that's what we do about that. Okay. All right, so I'll keep so going. <clears throat> okay, so subsections B and C provide for penalties for attempted crimes. So we just add some subdivisions here. There's no substantive changes. So sub B provides that um, the felony, the penalty for a felony attempt is either imprisonment for not more than 10 years or as the offense that was attempted is punishable, whichever of the two is less severe. And then sub C, I'm on page two now, this is misdemeanors. So punishment for an attempted misdemeanor uh, shall not exceed half of the penalty for the offense had the defendant succeeded. So moving to subsection D, so this is really um, where the primary changes are. All of the subdivisions here under D are applicable only to these serious violent felonies that are listed in subdivision one, starting on uh, line nine. So that first subdivision one just provides it for this list of um, serious violent felonies. Punishment shall be at the same level as the offense the defendant attempted. And then subdivision two, uh, this sets out a new rule, the substantial step rule. Um, this is language that comes from the model penal code. And it provides that if the, um, the person's guilty of an attempt under this subsection, so only for these crimes, if the, if the person had the purpose of the committing the offense and the person performed a substantial step toward the commission of the offense. And then um, it defines substantial step as conduct that's strongly corroborative of the firmness of the actor's purpose to complete the commission of the offense. So that language is similar to the language in the model penal code. It's not exact, 
Uh, model Penal Code language provides that conduct can't be held to constitute a, sub a substantial step unless it's strongly corroborative of the actor's criminal purpose. So there is some additional language here that's not in the Model Penal Code. So what the substantial step analysis does is it provides that preparatory acts um, can serve as the basis for attempts. So um, as I mentioned earlier when, we, when I started out, um, this is distinguishable from <coughs> current law in Vermont, which provides that preparatory acts are not culpable acts. Um, and the example I'll use is from the Hurley case, which is that possession of tools to commit a crime um, is insufficient for an attempt. Okay, so I'll move on to subsection three. Um, this talks about affirmative defenses. Subdivision A provides that um, <coughs> the legal impossible, there is no defense for impossibility. So the impossibility defense is that um, the offense was legally or factually impossible um, of commission. So this provides that uh, that is not a defense. And the majority of jurisdictions have rejected the impossibility defense as a defense for attempt. Give me an example of impossible. Sure. So, um, if the impossibility grows out of um, extraneous facts that aren't in control of the defendant, um, that would not be a defense. So, for example, um, if a defendant um, was um, commencing a criminal act and was interrupted in some way, um, that would be factors outside of the defendant's control. So the, the guard at the bank suddenly appeared and pressed the button and the, it notified the police who were yeah, close so proximity and they came in and stopped the bank property. Right. He wouldn't have been able to, you can't use that as an excuse for not right, so that, committing the bank robbery. That's a good example of being factually impossible. So if, the, if, if it were factually impossible for the defendant to commit the crime, then that would be an impossibility defense. <coughs> so moving on to page three, subdivision B, this is the abandonment defense. Um, Can I stop a minute? I want to just roll through my head trying to figure out another example of when you started. If someone was confined to an iron lung and made threats to commit mass mayhem somewhere and ordered online a weapon of some kind. I'm seeing that as somebody who is factually incapable of committing the offense. Mm -hmm. Is this language saying that that person has no defense? That, that that would not be a defense, yes. That's right. So they could be charged? Um, that there was no possibility they could ever carry it out? Yeah, so for an attempt, but yes, but don't forget that you have to, you have to prove not only that you had the intent to commit the crime, but that you also took a, a, a substantial step towards the commission of the crime. But under that scenario, if I ordered a weapon that could actually do that, let me back up a little bit. Is this model penal code language? The impossibility defense? Yeah. Um, let me see. I believe that it's not. Are there jurisdictions that have it? Do you know if it's ever been challenged before? Um, I would have to look into that. Okay. I know that the majority of jurisdictions Maybe have rejected it as a defense. Didn't, isn't this the uh, state to get back to or less. Yes. So why don't we wait for the state attorneys to defend their draft children? Okay. 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 Subdivision B, this is the abandonment defense. So this provides that it is an affirmative defense um, if the defendant proves it by a preponderance of the evidence that uh, the person abandoned the effort to commit the crime. And the circumstances are the, a complete and voluntary renunciation of criminal purpose. Um, so the language below provides that in order to be voluntary and complete renunciation, it can't be motivated by circumstances that make it more likely that the defendant will be caught, and it can't be because the defendant decided to postpone his or her conduct or transfer the criminal effort to another victim. 
So the abandonment defense essentially limits the substantial step rule so that a preparatory act um, isn't criminalized when a defendant abandons his or her attempt um, or intent to commit the crime. Can I ask yeah. one more clarification? I, I do apologize for this. That going back to page two, to the serious violent felonies, if the if the offense is attempted, the punishment is the same as if it was carried out. Yes. Okay. So I thought it's in. Okay. Any other questions for Brent? John Campbell. You may want to, uh, I had a person scheduled first. Do you need to go somewhere? No. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. No, I, I think I'd rather hear your. Well, why is this way? Because we discussed this right Yeah, sure. You want to? Everyone wants to join with me. He has been near me for a while. So. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, <clears throat> We could go over the reasons for introducing the bill. This, this, this is a draft that you basically, and you veered from the model penal code in some areas. Is that correct? The, well, there was a small variation from the model penal code. And uh, the model penal code, first of all, John Campbell, for the executive director of the state's attorneys and sheriffs. James Pepper, Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs. And um, we, uh, uh, as far as veering from the, the actual uh, model penal code, it was, uh, we left out what's referred to as subsection two of the, um, of the model penal code, which is more, <clears throat> they provide sort of examples of what they consider to be substantial steps uh, in reviewing other states, because most of uh, many states have gone to uh, the model penal code for attempt, and the uh, majority of them have done the same thing. The rationale would be more to let the laws of the state uh, develop in the common law that we have, uh, and they would then uh, be examples of substantial steps. The ones that are mentioned in here are just, again, they are just that examples uh, where that they would be considered by law. Um, a substantial step in which to prove the attempt. You want to add to that? I think you covered it. Um, well, I was looking at the Supreme Court decision in Sawyer, page 7, in the discussion of the void, and it talks about voluntary abandonment of an attempt, which is current law, case law. Um, has proceeded, and evidently this was a case of sexual assault, um, attempted sexual assault in 2005. Um, the defendant made repeated aggressive sexual advances towards the complainant, did not cease until the defendant turned away from the complainant, and she was able to run out of the room to contact police. So then they go on to use language that I don't quite understand completely, but sounds like the unavailability of an abandonment defense differentiates Vermont law on attempt from substantial steps analysis in the model penal code, which permits abandonment as an affirmative defense. But this person, they found that this person, he was guilty of the attempt even though he didn't rape the woman. And that, am I reading that wrong? And so would what you're doing in um, either 3A or 3B change that so that this person would no longer be guilty? So what, what one of the, the, I think, the strong points? If the same uh, circumstances yeah. arose. Well, let me just say this. I think well, I'm, I'm trying to get an answer to that question. I'm trying to understand if what we're doing would would have in the in A says there's no defense because the, the woman ran away. And is that what you're trying to get at, or are you or would B provide an affirmative defense to the person that he was no longer able to commit the crime because the woman was able to run away? 
I believe A is dealing with the the uh, impossibility defenses, which there really it comes in two forms. One is the legal impossibility, the other one is factual impossibility. Okay. Um, the legal impossibility is, is one in which uh, a person might be accused of, of committing a crime, but in reality, what he's being or she is being accused of is, is impossible. In other words, they don't meet the elements of, of the actual uh, crime. Uh, whereas the second, the uh, factual uh, impossibility uh, comes about when uh, there's something else, not uh, an action or an action by the defendant, but something else uh, external uh, that makes it impossible for the actual crime to uh, be carried out or uh, to be with, actually considered. With, with similar circumstances, evidently, in this particular case, the person was uh, guilty of sexual assault because the woman was able to run away from him, but his intent and he made several uh, moves towards consummation of the crime. So, it, and she somehow got away from him. But I'm wondering if, under either A or B, we are now giving him an affirmative defense that um, we are. We would be giving uh, the defendant in the void an affirmative defense, which he would have to prove by a preponderance of the evidence. However, the facts in this case, the, the mere fact that uh, she ran to the bathroom doesn't mean that his criminal intent... Uh, she ran to get to the police. So, so that he would have to... She was able to call the police. Maybe she did go to the bathroom. I don't know where yeah. she went to call the police. I forget exactly the facts of the case, too. I have read that. But uh, I think he would have to show by a preponderance of the evidence that he actually abandoned his criminal purpose, which uh, I don't think her being able to escape is, is sufficient to establish that he abandoned his criminal purpose. It, it sort of actually uh, focuses on what actually the differences are between what we currently have and if we go to the model penal code. And that is, you know, we're looking, one, what we have now is looking at the actual act and the proximity uh, of that act toward uh, the consummation uh, of the actual target offense. And whereas the model penal code looks to see whether there have been substantial steps where the actor himself or herself had the intent and went, uh, undertook the substantial steps uh, to carry out the target offense. And so you're dealing more, I think, with the, the actor's uh, uh, intentional um, steps to get into uh, towards actually committing it to as opposed to whether there was an actual overt act and then how close in time was that act to the actual target offense. But, but under this, with what Sawyer did, be an attempt. I would not, I, I, again, I, I would rather not discuss the sort well, of case because but, they're still active. Okay. It, so it may, be, can, it may be that you'd rather not discuss it or we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for <coughs> the Supreme Court decision. <coughs> and what is a substantial step under H25 as amended in your proposal? I, what is a substantial? What would, would be a substantial? How would we define a substantial step? Right now, evidently, a substantial step is walking onto the school grounds with a loaded firearm and having made serious threats. And yeah. I, evidently, and maybe I'm misreading Joe the Supreme Court decision, but it looks like you have to do something overt. Um, you know, I was interested in the case. The, the, the one that wasn't guilty was the guy who had the, and both were in Windsor Prison, I believe, and one had the, had the blades, but he wasn't guilty because he hadn't started to saw the bars. And the guy who jumped into the laundry basket was guilty because he made that attempt. So I'm curious as to when we move from, in a case, you know, obviously, you can't. You don't want to talk about Sawyer. That's understandable. But on the other hand, that was where the court made the decision. So, yeah. 
what is the substantial step? Okay, under, 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 under federal, this. Yeah, from federal, we get a couple examples in a second, but I think you have to again understand is that um, with the the over step versus the uh, or the over act versus substantial steps, the over act brings it again closer in proximity to the time of committing the uh, target offense. Let me give you a real example. Uh, wouldn't rise probably wouldn't rise to one of these crimes. I'm gone to a public meeting. I get back into my car with the reporter from seven days, factual. I get into my car and I say, I would love to meet that guy in a dark alley. And for whatever reason he prints that, have I made a substantial step towards an assault or you know, serious bodily injury? By what you just said, I don't think you did. Well, I want to meet we, somebody in an alley. Well, we would need to, as a prosecutor, would really need to establish your clear criminal intent first. That's step one, and I don't think that you, that statement would establish a clear criminal intent. And then beyond that, uh, we would have to show that you took a substantial step in order to carry out that criminal intent. Well, what would be that? Well, well, if you, if you went to, uh, yeah, so, that's a, a good example. That is, if, if you went and you had planned to meet the person in actually the location, if you enticed, and you enticed them to come into to that alleyway, um, and you had before you got to the alleyway, you had stopped and bought some brass knuckles, or you picked them up somewhere, or you or or a bat gun. Anything like that. Those are all things that we would have to show as uh, as prosecutors. We would have to show uh, from an evidentiary standpoint that these things you did and they moved you toward the actual target offense. And that would be, I'm assuming, by meeting him in the alley, you meant by assaulting him in the alley. I don't know what I meant. I just would have liked another in the dark alley. <laughs> well, if you were meeting them there for you, I'm not going to tell you. If you're meeting them there, if you're meeting them there socially, that's fine. You know that you. Had, well, yeah, I mean, he took it that I was threatening. Him. Okay. Again, we would have to prove that there was uh, number one that that uh, there was a the threat that you had the intent to go ahead and to assault this guy. Um, and then we would uh, have to show that you know you took substantial steps to to achieve that. Let me, I think we got some other extant examples well, maybe here. Maybe mine was a bad example, but I, I think that's what people worry about is, so I you know, write that, he wrote that down, I didn't write it down. Mark Davis wrote it down. But that's, again, you have to understand, we have to, the, 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 that, that case, if I, you went in there and, and asked a, uh, someone to prosecute based on that, you, that this appeared on the, uh, in seven days saying that you want to meet the guy in the alley, I, I, there's nothing there. I would. I, mean, I don't. I don't see any prosecutor taking that case. Okay. So I have two Maybe questions. Maybe County with what I've I don't know. I'll so, ask her when I finish here. So I, what, what is different right now with the laws that we have in terms of him saying I want to meet this guy in a dark alley, him going, setting up a time with the guy to meet with him, stopping and picking up his brass knuckles. Why do we need this? Why can't he be prosecuted now if, if he takes those it's steps? A good, it's a good question. I think what, what that actually will define what substantial step is because in, in or I mean over... But why do we need would, this? Hold, hold on a second. Okay. I think, so in, in this case, the one you just brought, uh, it, the overt act would have to be something where he was, or that the person with the brass knuckles, if Senator Sears was there, that he was actually within close proximity to the person where he could actually carry out the attack. So I would say that based on that case and then the other case that uh, is mentioned here with the beer bottle, even a, a person under our, our statute, if I had a bottle raising my the bottle over my head to hit him, I'm not in close enough proximity where I'm actually going to do it. I'd have to be, we feel that the overt act is, you would almost have to be coming down with that bottle very close to where it would hit his head. And you would have to have those brass knuckles mm -hmm. uh, aiming towards his face and with that fact that I could carry it out. So that is the problem here, is the fact that there's really little, if, uh, a chance to really deter or prevent an action that we that is uh, a person that has a criminal intent to carry out, um, whether it be a bank robbery, okay. sexual sexual assault, 
So we're saying that this this is a law that's based on it's it's uh, antiquated. Uh, it, uh, it was over um, you know 100 years ago that that uh, that case um, occurred, and right now it's I think we find that in order to protect the public, um, that we should have uh, the uh, ability if we show that there are substantial steps taken toward committing a, an offense, uh, sure. that, and that the person has a criminal intent. That we are able to prosecute that. Watch me with one of your examples. Oh, okay. I have another question when you're done. I guess. Go ahead. Well, I just this isn't a question uh, of substantial step, but on page three, of you, it isn't it isn't an affirmative defense if if they abandon it because it increases the probability of detection. I, I mean, how are? Well, of course, I'm going to abandon my idea if, if I think I'm going to get caught. That happens to little kids who take money out of their mom's purse. If they think mom is standing there, they're not going to do it. I mean, how do you? This uh, this law, but the model penal code actually recognizes the fact that people might have second thoughts about right. doing something, and if that occurs. Then they should be able to use that as a defense. Right. But not right if now, they did it. Don't. But okay. not if they did it because they were afraid of getting caught. That's what it says here. Well, there's a. It must be complete and voluntary. So if right. you have the police standing over you and you say, you know what, I might not do this. I'll give you an yeah. example. There, there's a second circuit case which basically involved a bank robbery, and where uh, a group of people went to rob a bank and. Um, they had, you know, the masks, they had the guns, they had everything, and they went to, they already scoped out the bank, uh, they went to the bank, but they felt that, you know, something was hinky that they didn't want to go through it. They stopped uh, until the next day. So the next day they went back, and as they were getting ready to get out of the car, the FBI, the FBI um, went and arrested them. Now, they raised on appeal, their defense was that they were, it was an attempt, they didn't really, you know, have the plan to go forward through it. They didn't complete the, the, uh, uh, the action of robbing the bank, therefore they should not be um, charged with that. And the uh, Second Circuit ruled the fact that, though, that they had taken those substantial steps. They used the model code, penal code interpretation as the substantial but, steps to find that they had been arrested. So could they have been the day before when they abandoned their idea and went away, could the FBI have gone and arrested them then because the way this is written is they didn't do it because they were in fear of getting caught because something was wrong. So that would have meant that the FBI could have gone to wherever they were and arrested them because they abandoned the idea, but it wasn't a true um, abandonment of the idea. It would have to be a complete you know, renunciation well, of, how, of how you, well, you have to wait, prove oh, it. Okay. That's, right. those okay. are some that okay. is a much closer case. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Would be what you have to prove. Right. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. Other questions for Joe? Um, you are. I appreciate what you guys are trying to do. One thing I'm a little nervous about here is I'm trying to legislate again in the midst of fear yeah. and, and paranoia and understandable concerns. But I don't want to get this wrong. It seems to me in the description that you're trying to reach, the words overt act versus substantial step. Let me go back to my example of the guy in the iron line. If he threatens to kill someone and purchases a gun. I'm assuming for the purpose of this argument that that is an overt act towards a given objective. But if he says, I'm going to kill James Pepper tomorrow at noontime, and I've got a gun coming today, is that what you're calling now a substantial step towards carrying out the offense? It seems to me a substantial step implies there are steps that are taken in a sequence of events, as opposed to an overt act which might be isolated all by itself. An overt act uh, must be in close t 
temporal proximity to the end. end. Today, but I think that's the Supreme Court's ruling that right. that was not the case in the most recent right. case we're talking about. So that's all good law still, okay. even if this, yeah. Uh, we're not doing writing or thinking. I'm sorry? We're not doing writing or thinking. Is that, is that, a, and that's, this, this person's thinking, I would love to do this. Joe's example in the iron lung. I mean, obviously, he's thinking he would love to do it, but he's probably incapable of doing it. So, just thinking. That's my next question. I, I think, no, I think you, again, that you might have the intent, that might show that you have the criminal intent to actually try to commit this target offense. However, you still have to, the state would still have to prove uh, that you took substantial steps to complete that. And, um, I, I would say if, if you're in the iron lung and you have a criminal intent that we can prove that you want to kill someone and you hire a hitman, that would be a substantial yeah. step. Mm -hmm. But if you're in the iron lung and you have, you know, you've ordered a gun, I don't think ordering a gun by itself is not. Well, that, the, see, good or my problem you can't is get through a background. At, at the same time, you're trying to, at the same time, you're trying to get to where you want to be with substantial step analysis. You are removing the factual inability to complete that chain of events, and I'm troubled by that. I don't know that I can iron this all out in my head in this instance. Um, I think the, t the the intent here is to adopt a um, statutory scheme that is used in. Uh, I think around 20, 25 case, or states that are doing this to show and recognize that we as a society, that there, that the laws that currently that we have, and most of them coming under the common law, and that are based on um, uh, different proximity tests that have been put up through the different um, areas, that that is not sufficient to achieve the goal of protecting our uh, communities and that there is a better opportunity to provide uh, the safety, to provide deterrence, to provide prevention um, to this under the model penal code. If, if a police officer cannot arrest somebody until I got my finger on the trigger and I'm getting ready to shoot you, um, it would be better off if the and we are saying as a model, as a policy that we should be saying that if the person has a criminal intent to shoot you, does everything, buys the gun, uh, goes not, to your house, let me that be before they put the trigger on, pull the trigger. Let me be clear. Yeah. I'm not disputing the policy mm -hmm. of trying to correct something that may be flawed. What I'm concerned about is taking a step beyond that that is unintended. So at the same time we're trying to patch up the overt act and give it a substantial step analysis. You are removing a factual impossibility from completing that process, and that's what I don't understand. I'm trying to wrap my head. Why is it we are denying someone an affirmative defense if they can factually demonstrate that it is literally impossible to carry out that substantial change? Well, I think, you know, these are, every one of these substantial step analyses is going to be very fact-dependent, very fact-specific, and I think that a little bit of common sense will come into play when a judge is looking at these things. But at the same time, James, you're saying we're going to remove a factual analysis. Mm -hmm. That's what's bothering me. And I, I understand where you want to go. I'm concerned that the step being taken is going to literally mean somebody who can't actually complete the process is roped into that same analysis. I think what the, the factual part is the fact that if you have a defendant that is has the absolute criminal intent to carry out an offense and does take substantial steps towards doing it, um, not knowing that he cannot that or she cannot complete the crime, um, I think that's where this has uh, the uh, factual impossibility has been developed in over you know, years for the, the new 12 and the decision. An attempt under Vermont law requires an attempt to commit a crime coupled with an act that but for an interruption would result in the completion of the crime. So <clears throat> and I'm, I'm 
Can you tell me the difference between that and in line 16, a substantial step is conduct that is firmly corroborative of firmness of the actor's purpose to complete the commission of the crime. So that you're using the same terms there, am I correct? Substantial stack is conduct that, so oh, I'm sorry, you're, you're referring I guess to I'm that. arguing that page two. page two of your draft 1.1 1. 1. <clears throat> line 16, 17, and 18 defines what a substantial step is. Mm -hmm. And a substantial step, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm reading this, is conduct that is strongly corroborative of firmness of the actor's purpose to complete the commission of the offense. Right. Supreme Court says, or three members of the Supreme Court said, an attempt under Vermont law requires an intent to commit a crime coupled with an act that but for an interruption will result in the completion of the crime. Explain to me the difference between that and that. Right. So, so we, the how does this get us any further than what is current law as defined by the court? That's what I don't understand, right. and I'm sorry, I'm not a lawyer, so maybe I'm misreading something here. So um, that that this may not get you where you want to be. Understand all the other language and affirmative defenses and all that, but. But if you're defining a substantial fact as conduct that is strongly corroborated, the firmness of the act of purpose. And then you read 12 on, on page 4. Okay. So, uh, first of all, so just so everyone. Well, I'm will... forcing you to talk about the Supreme Court decision, so I'm not talking about. No, I, I, I feel comfortable enough for that. Uh, no, I understand that. But first of all, let me explain. So, um, those who don't know this, this is the language of model penal code. This is not a substantial step. It's not like John Campbell and James Pepper all of a sudden came up with, uh, this is what our definition of what we think okay. a substantial step is. So this has been something that is law uh, in 25 other jurisdictions, or approximately 25 other jurisdictions. Um, they take bits and pieces of the model penal code. Uh, so this is what has already been uh, before courts, and has been argued, and uh, this has been accepted. What and I think we're you're talking again. You you're you're here. You're talking about uh, the intent of the actor and what the uh, and what the actor is is doing. Your 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 actions or that the Supreme Court is discussing here. Um, they basically say what we have currently, and that it has to be uh, an action that overt action has to occur. But that if there's but for something stopping or interrupting this uh, would be result in the completion of the crime. So yes, here you could say uh, that um, uh, the impossibility of completing the crime is uh, discussed in this opinion. The Hurley case, which we can talk about, mm -hmm. the language ends with the phrase "will result in the completion of a crime." It seems to me your language is shifting from the possibility that the crime is completed over to what is the purpose of the perpetrator. And when you subtract the ability of the potential perpetrator to say, factually, I couldn't complete the crime, to me that's problematic. And that's, I guess, the difference that I see between what is currently law and what you guys are trying to resolve. I don't want us to go a step too far. I want to be able to help where you're going, but I'm going to submit that where you're going has shifted the conversation from can this person complete the crime to what is their purpose. And when you get to the words purpose and then subtract from them the ability to raise an affirmative defense, I find that difficult. And I don't know if that's really where you want to go or if that's just the why don't you guys think about some of the questions? Maybe I'm missing something. I, uh, I'm more than happy to come back and talk about the, uh, the impossibility, because that's where it seems like we're hung up on just No, I'm, I'm not hung up on the impossibility. That doesn't, because um, I don't think they're going to charge some guy in an iron mm -hmm. Okay. Right. But, but I am hung up on where we're going. 
doesn't uh, may not be further from where you want to get to, except we've now provided an affirmative defense. Yeah, I, I think I, I don't. I'm not sure that. Uh, Again, not being able to talk about soya makes it very difficult. But reading that case and reading all the information, I'm concerned that he never got to if, a substantial step. If, if, um, if, look at, let's take a look at Parkland for a second okay. and, and adjust that a bit, the scenario. Um, so we know, uh, obviously, what happened, but uh, if uh, the fact that this guy had planned this, he, he had the, um, the weapons, he planned the, uh, he got the all the rounds, all the magazines, whatever, he's ready to, to rock and roll. And um, if the police caught him on his way over to, let's driving over to the school, I do not think that that would survive with the, with the overt act that requirement of our current statute. However, under the model penal code, I believe that we, he could have been charged at that point because there were a significant a number of substantial steps that will corroborate that that, number one, that to show what his in, uh, intent was to go and to uh, uh, kill as many people as possible in those buildings and schools. And second, that he, uh, the substantial steps towards it was Getting all, getting all the uh, um, the uh, uh, equipment, planning uh, how he was going to do it, and move, and actually going, getting in his car, driving towards the the school. Um, I think we could have, he could have been arrested for if we, if there was the model penal code, let's say if that happened here, that we would be able to arrest him at that point. I don't think, based on um, what the recent interpretations of, uh, of attempt and with overt action, I think that we would have faced the exact same problem that the Supreme Court has been discussing in this case. So we're trying to be preventative and to try to see that this doesn't happen down here or up here. I'm just saying, I'm just reading the wording and then reading the wording that the Supreme Court, the three members of the Supreme Court wrote, and I'm seeing similar language and that I'm still trying to understand a substantial step. Buying a firearm is not a substantial step, is, or is it? Well, oh, I think it is a substantial How step. How does buying the firearm be a substantial step? First, if you fail to get the firearm. Okay. First, if, if, if you, you fail to get okay, well, the guy in that. the parliament yeah. had failed to buy, had failed to get the firearm, would that have been a substantial step? I think you have to look at all of the other factors that might be here. Number one, you have to show the fact that he actually is planning on doing that. He's got that criminal intent to kill uh, these students. And then you look to see is exactly what, what did he do to make that happen? You know, he knows in his mind that he wants to kill all these kids. What did he do after that that was leading him to the target offense of actual I want murder. a law. I think we all want a law. That if somebody is planning to shoot up a school, that we're able to stop that person and charge that person. And that preventive action if we're able to and, find out. And I believe mind. And not allow and not wait for that person to have a hand a finger on the trigger before they you know, and have to walk into the school with a finger on the trigger in order to stop it. So I think that's what we all want. Just so if you want that, that is, that's what you have here. Well, I can that's that's I Obviously, that. keep looking back at the defender general, so I mean, he'll come up and explain why. We're no, I'm not looking at the attorney general. Oh, um, okay, maybe he can explain. Well, it's not really the attorney general, but it's he represents the attorney general. And so I wasn't necessarily looking at that, although he did shake his head a number of times when you spoke. I didn't see that. He might have been thinking about something else, though. But, uh, yeah. I think he had a bug in his ear. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, there, there is a, on kind of the spectrum. We're all trying to get to the same place, right. is what I'm trying to say, is just that we've gotten there. On the spectrum of substantial steps, I think um, one example out of the, the Missouri Supreme Court determined that they had a case where a kid uh, was writing journals, obsessed with Columbine, writing journals about shooting up a school. Um, his parents committed him to a mental hospital. 
when he turned 18, he got out. Um, he stopped taking his medication. He um, bought two, two guns, uh, did extensive target practice. Um, his mom found the receipts for the guns in, in his pocket and called the police. During the course of the interview with the police, he mentioned something about shooting up the school. Um, Missouri has the model penal code. The, the Supreme Court determined that as a matter of law, the buying of the gun and the extensive target practice were not insu insufficient as a matter of law to, to determine a okay. substantial set. And then that uh, then turned to a jury question. You say were insufficient? Or not? Were not insufficient to establish a substantial set. And then again, that's as a matter of law, and then it turns to, to the jury to determine whether or not he actually had the criminal intent and whether that was sufficient. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't understand. I guess I, I'm concerned about this whole thing. Um, and I don't understand why does the example you gave of, of the Parkland guy, if that had happened here, why we couldn't use 221? Because he showed an imminent risk. We could have used 221. And I guess my concern, one of my concerns is then charging him with the exact same uh, punishment as if he had actually carried it out. And one of the things that this may be totally irrelevant, but when the uh, doctor, the pediatrician was here and talking about um, 221, and she was talking about um, suicide people, and once somebody attempts suicide and they're it's um, uh, they don't do it because there some their the guns are taken away from them for a while or whatever. They almost never try it again. Is her experience and so why? I, I guess I'm really concerned about this person has this intent to do it and we're going to put the same. Are you, are you same, saying? Are you saying though that, that you think that someone like Cruz, if we had stopped him just this one time, I, that he wouldn't try it again? I, I don't again? know. I have no idea if he might have tried again. He may have been having some kind of a psychotic break, and he, well, see, I, I don't why, know. But that's I'm, why I'm, you had developed what the criminal intent was, and in you know you look back at this, at I, least what just, they know now. I know. Um, your two twenty one. You know, could be used, and uh, but that again is uh, limited. I mean, if if um, they're it's well, limited, uh, but, right? But it's not. But we're not going to charge him with murder. But, but if I have somebody who's going in to who's going to uh, get a, a, his guns, his AR-15s, and have multiple magazines, and and we know that he has the intent, or she has the intent to go and shoot up the school. She's written. Or he's yeah. written diaries saying he's going to do it. He gets in the school or in his car. He drives to school. Uh, he's ready to go. Yes, I believe that that person is probably intent on carrying that out, and I believe that that person should be subject to the to uh, being arrested for attempted murder. I need to set the guy in this here. Again. Okay. I'll be quiet. Uh, no, no, be quiet. No, the, the, we all agree that it's better to prevent something than to have it happen. But when it's prevented, how do we hold somebody accountable who may continue to present a danger to other people? Um, may not do the exact same act, but may present a danger. Uh, clearly, Vermont law, reading this decision, um, in terms of attempts, is one place where we could look to make significant changes. I don't think there's anybody here who doesn't want to hold somebody accountable for their behavior. The question is, um, does our current law allow somebody to get away with that behavior and not be held accountable? And that's what, what I want to get to. And I think we're, you know, we, we've skirted around it enough as a committee. Um, and maybe it's Joe, I know you have another question of John and, and Pepper, and we can go ahead with that, but I just want to bring us back to the goal here is to create a statute that will help to hold somebody accountable who exhibits the behavior that was exhibited. At, at, 
we don't know how many shootings in this nation have been, mass shootings have been averted because of something happening. And we, so I don't know, we, none, we never know what's been averted, we only know what's happened. Right. So, Senator, what we did when this, when we decided with the model penal code, and as all of us do here, when you look to other states that have been successful, maybe in discussing and dealing with the same topic, the case that that uh, Pepper just mentioned over in Missouri, um, if you again hear all of the facts of that case, they will sound eerily familiar to you. Um, and so, they had this language they were able to prosecute that person for those facts that we just gave you, that you can you can put those, compare those to any fact situation you want. But I just think that, that this is the, the uh, method to go. We've been asked uh, to try to help in this situation. Um, I've got personal reasons for trying to help here, and I'd like to have something happen before uh, we face a situation that we can't stop. Great. I think we're all on the same page, Joe. Go. So using the Parkland situation example that you gave before, all the substantial steps have been taken. The kid is driving to the school and he's stopped. Police investigate the kid, search of the car, there's no weapons. Under your bill, what would you charge him with? Well, you know, you're saying he's got no weapons, so I then I don't I think you take out a major aspect of this. I mean, well, it's was not just because the bill that you're presenting us has removed any kind of factual ability to say it couldn't have been carried out. No, I, that, that, I, I don't believe that that's what factual uh, the factual uh, impossibility well, we're talking about. Uh, so, particularly on that issue. <coughs> the, uh, that Senator, I, I, the reason I handed you that is I'm curious if you think that that covers, and it's the straight model penal code, uh, the substantial step, which is in part C, 1C, I believe. Which maybe, um, maybe the other hand, where, where 3A comes from and what it's designed to do would help us understand it better. I'm still on uh, two, uh, D2. You can, if you want, I mean, there, there's examples there, as I said, the section two of, of that. There's nothing, uh, I mean, that can be put in. It's just the fact that this, again, is model penal codes giving you a, a suggestions. They're not exhaustive by any means, but if you'll notice in there the examples, I think those examples cover what we're talking about here and, again, could be used as reference to the interpretation. The fact that the gun jammed is not a reason to say that the addict, that's the person not right. No, I don't think that's right. right. That's well, what that's I think. There you go, it's an impossibility yeah. there. But if yeah. the gun jams, he still could be charged with that. Right. And that's not a defense. Right. right. You know, legal impossibility, that's a defense. Or I should say that the Judge Greer's. I guess I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I I've been, feel like I've been torn as tattered here, by the way. Spent all weekend trying to answer questions about this and getting a little tired of it. I'm sure everybody else is. But, Judge? Senator, uh, for the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. I, I think as I listen to the discussion that's taking place this morning, I'm in the. the the least position to, to be able to assist the, the committee in, in trying to achieve what you stated as your goal because of uh, um, obviously my role. And, and I, 
this is clearly a policy decision, um, and I'm not in a position to to say how this bill, if enacted with this language, would the impact it would have on the Sawyer decision. So. Um, I would be glad to answer any questions the committee has, but this is strictly policy. And I understand what the committee and some of the other witnesses are attempting to do here, but I, it's certainly not our role to advocate for it, uh, one way or another. I, I, I don't think that will help the committee, but I trust they understand the position uh, that the court finds itself in, particularly with a pending case. Well, it, yeah, it makes it difficult with a pending case, but. Uh, I mean, I think you asked. My frustration is I'm not sure this language gets any further down the road than. I think you have asked the appropriate question, and that is if this bill was passed in its present form, would the activities, actions, behaviors of, of um, in the Sawyer case amount to a substantial. And, I, and I'm just a step, and I'm not in a position to I offer. I don't think anything. you should offer. I and I'm not going to. But I think I appreciate your being here, and uh, thank you. There may be a point in the process that my testimony may be of more assistance to the committee, and I will uh, await testimony from other witnesses. But thank you for the opportunity. Well, we wait, and tomorrow morning we'll get to Matt Valerio with David Sure. If you want to take the Defender General first, that's fine by me. I'm going to be a while. I think he's going to be a while. Maybe share. I mean, whatever the committee prefers. Yeah. Well, I thought, well, we already provided your testimony. It's not very long. Nope. So I thought we could get that done. And then we have to talk about this something. House changes to a bill. Uh, for the record, Chloe White, ACLU Vermont. Um, we have, we have serious concerns regarding this proposed language. Um, we recognize the good intention behind the effort, but we think it raises significant constitutional problems and would be a setback in the progress uh, Vermont has made towards improving its criminal justice system. We think there may be better ways to address the legitimate concerns that motivated this language. Um, first, we share, um, I think you'll hear from um, the Defender General tomorrow, um, concerns regarding this proposal, especially re with regard to lowering the standard so dramatically that it could have could have wider application than intended. Additionally, uh, we're very concerned that it would punish some attempted crimes as harshly as committed acts, and this change would be applied inconsistently with the lower attempt standard for some crimes, but not others. And Vermont would seem to be an outlier in these regards. Um, in addition to these due process concerns, there are major First Amendment problems with the proposed definition. Treating speech, such as a journal entry, as a substantial step because it corroborates the actor's intent would contravene well-established free, free speech principles. The U.S. Supreme Court has taken care to set a high bar for incitement or true threats, but under this proposed definition, it seems the government could charge a defendant with attempt for anything they wrote that was strongly corroborative of the actor's intent. Our Constitution doesn't allow someone to be convicted of attempted murder for something written in a private diary, a blog post, a violent song, or in the course of other activity protected by the First Amendment. By expanding the definition of attempt to cover all firm expressions of criminal intent, the law threatens to punish a large amount of constitutionally protected expression and expressive conduct as well make criminals out of people who may express an intent to do something unlawful, but are either not really serious or change their minds before anything is really underway. Um, I would also you know, uh, note that, you know, as, as we know, um, uh, you know, especially teenagers, juveniles, um, you know, they, there may be a tendency to be you know, more dramatic than, than actual intent. Um, uh, and I think that this is uh, this could also cover you know these dramatic intentions that actually are not intentions at all. Um, so if the committee is committed to changing the attempt language, notwithstanding all these issues, um, we think there should at least be a higher bar set. Uh, for example, at minimum, we would propose the following additional language. So right now, it's a substantial step is conduct which is strongly corroborative of the firmness of the actor's purpose to complete the commission of the offense and which is more than mere preparation. Um, so this could help diminish some of these concerns, but would not dismiss them. Thank you. Is there a question for Chloe? I think you're... Thanks. 
cut a loan or something. What do you think the substantial step is? Under, you, you raised that a substantial step. Do you think that a substantial step would be saying, I'd like to meet you in a dark alley? Would that be a substantial step? Or under, under draft 1.1? No, I think that alone would not be a substantial what step. What is a substantial step that is corroborative of the firmness of the actor's purpose? And you would add language that said, which is more than mere preparation. And I'm curious as to how that more clearly um, lessens the possibility that writing something in a journal which you also raise mm -hmm. uh, would be seen as a step. I mean, I, you know, I've read a lot of fiction in my life. And one, I suppose, could argue that somebody writing fiction has mm -hmm. planned something. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's, I think we'd have to parse the difference um, between someone writes a violent song about getting rid of their ex-husband with their best friend and you know serving him poison and dumping him in a lake uh, there is and you know they buy a large amount of uh, of legal um, illegal substance that in large amounts is poisonous um, you know and I think but if they do all that and then they write this song, I, I worry that that is seen as a substantial step without, you know, you know, what is the purpose of buying that large amount of substance? Maybe it's because, you know, maybe it's cleaner and they want to clean their house very well. <laughs> and, you know, they went to Costco. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't mean to make light, but, you know, there's, there's also, you know, and there's an intent to do something lawful in the heat of the moment or in, you know, uh, without this, you know, without a cooling off. And then there's, um, you know, how do we distinguish that? Is that enough? I would worry that that would be enough under the proposed language. But there's, you know, where is the, how, do, how does one know then that, that is, that that's going to happen? How do we charge that as an attempt? And then, you know, charge that or have it carry the same sentence as an actual murder. Can I ask you a question yeah, about let that? Let me okay. read something here. That this is from uh, Professor William T. Pizzi. Mm -hmm. And I sent this up to him. Yeah. Um, and if you read his conclusion, mm -hmm. uh, he talked about, I've come away from this exercise convinced that the model penal code did a very good job of clarifying the point at which conduct suffices for attempted attempt liability to rejecting common law approaches that often required a physical proximity or a temporal proximity to the crime in favor of the requirement that the person has taken a substantial step strongly corroborative of the actor's criminal purpose. And I don't think that's what we've got here, by the way. Um, strongly corroborative of the person's purpose. Especially when the crime is serious, we need to give law enforcement the authority to intervene and stop the crime before it directly threatens injury. The model penal code thus avoids the problem in Rizzo, the court contemplating the police, complimenting the police for their wonderful work in arresting a gunman looking to rob a payroll, but leaving the gunman free of any criminal liability so that he may rob the, the payroll as soon as they obtain more accurate information on the place and time of the payroll uh, delivery. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that seems to be what the model penal code is designed to do, is not allow, say, well, gee, the, the fact that you got the wrong day for the delivery of the payroll and failed to rob it at the right time, it's not an excuse. But on the, on the second, but this comment about strongly corroborative of the actor's criminal purpose, is that, would that help from your perspective? I, mean, I think that's, I mean, isn't that a lot of, that's like... That's a lot of what you're saying here? Or, no, I was saying more, isn't that uh, pretty akin to what the language is uh, proposed, is conduct which is strongly corroborative of the firmness no. of the actor's purpose? I yeah. Can I give her an example of that? Yeah. So, on Saturday, 
in Brattleboro there was a, uh, he looked, looked like a young man in his late teens or early 20s. It's hard to tell because he had on a, a long black kind of robe kind of thing with a hood on it with a face piece that came down to here. So you couldn't see him at all. Looked a little scary walking around town and people were kind of avoiding him. Um, if he had, if he had gone into Sam's and bought um, a knife, and then they stopped him and they found that he had journals with pictures of him stabbing people, would he have fallen under here because he had journals with pictures and and he was looking really scary and he went in and is that a substantial step? I mean, could he have been? I worry that it, I worry that that is uh, that could be the uh, the outcome of this. I worry that the uh, the outcome is. And he like, might not have had that intent at all. I, I mean, right? We don't know, but but anyway, okay. It's yeah. going to be hard to determine. That's for huh? sure. Huh? It's yeah. going to be hard to determine. That's I for sure. I know. I I really worry about. It. Any other questions for Paul? Joe? Any comments on where we're headed? To a mess. Yes. Tomorrow morning, we will cancel everything that we had scheduled and pick up with, actually, I think, tomorrow morning. Oh, saliva for testing. For Chloe White and Brian Grant. But we'll cancel tomorrow morning at okay. 8.30. We'll pick up with this, with uh, David Schur and Matt Valerio and anybody else who wants to testify and then try to mark up the bill. So cool.